appreciate everyone uh, joining in for this uh, class on Romans. Maybe we finish tonight, maybe we don't, but we'll be close. <clears throat> uh, left, last time I left off uh, with 18th verse of chapter 15, and may just go back over that again since it's kind of a, the sentence kind of continues on into 19 where we actually said we were going to start uh, tonight. So let's we'll start with verse 18 of, of uh, Romans chapter 15. Before we do, though, let's have a short word of prayer. If you bow with me, please. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray, pray that we bless thy students of thy word for the good that it, we may derive from it. For we know that in thy word is the gospel of salvation. We know that wisdom comes from thee, and thou hast. Uh, encapsulated wisdom in thy word that we want to become wise as thou art wise then we must uh, know thy word so we're pre appreciative of the fact that you have left it for us and we pray father for the diligence and, and determination to learn thy, thy word and hide it in our hearts that we may not sin we're thankful for the Christ who died for us that we might have our sins washed away. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> in verse 18, it says, For I will not dare to speak of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in words indeed, to make the Gentiles obedient. <clears throat> hey, you recall what... Uh, uh, Paul is, has done for the Gentiles and, and was going to do for the Gentiles. So he, he was uh, properly had a, a, a claim to boast about the things he had done, but he only boasted in, in Christ in matters relating to God. He did not and would not mention one thing that Christ had not brought about uh, through him and him alone. He didn't uh, try to claim somebody else's, claim, claim credit for somebody else's work. <clears throat> he confined himself strictly to his own work. And of course, we know that the purpose of uh, all of Paul's efforts was to bring the mes message of the gospel, God's power to save to the Gentiles. Because he wanted them to be saved just, just as much as he wanted his uh, Jewish brethren to be saved. So he uh, did this in mighty signs and wonders in verse 19 by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to uh, uh, Il Elysium, uh, Elysium, I can't pronounce that. I have fully uh, preached the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> so using the powers uh, gifted to him by the full measure of the Holy Spirit of the apostles received the full measure, <clears throat> he was able to preach the gospel to those uh, areas out and about from Jerusalem, especially to the north of Jerusalem. When he left an area, uh, there remained in it very little primary work to be done by others. <clears throat> uh, nor could others improve upon his results. That's why he called the, the peerless Paul. <clears throat> Verse 20. <clears throat> and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. So Paul wanted his work to be an original work, uh, not merely a gleaning from others, from another's work. To build on another man's foundation denotes other locations where churches have already been established. Of course, uh, we know that Paul cannot always go where he de desired sometimes the spirit hindered him 
<clears throat> we read in Acts the 16th chapter, verses 6 through 10. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia the, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they uh, tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit, uh, Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Of course, you know that at the beginning of Romans, Paul indicated a wish to go to Spain. We don't know if he ever did. <clears throat> but he had a wish to go. In verse uh, 21 of chapter 15, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. And that comes from Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what they had not heard they shall consider so paul was sent to preach to the gentiles in fulfillment of prophecy in acts the 26 chapter verses 14 through 20 uh, you can read uh, most of that on your own, but I'll read uh, 17th, uh, 18th verse. It said, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And he's talking to Paul to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And Paul said, uh, talking to King Agrippa, I was not uh, disobedient to the heavenly vision. In verse 22 of chapter 15 of Romans, For this reason I have been much hindered from coming to you. The the phrase for this reason um, that meant there's so many places to preach where the gospel had not been preached that he was delayed in his desire to visit Rome. Rome, that's what hindered him from uh, visiting Rome earlier. Verse 23: But now, no longer having a place in these parts. And having a great desire these many years to come to you. Paul was a, a well traveled man. Uh, he had preached the gospel in the parts which he had uh, has uh, heretofore visited. Paul had long desired to visit Rome. We, we uh, read that in, in the first chapter of Romans. In verse 24, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. He did not achieve his desire to visit Rome by means he likely uh, did not anticipate as of this writing. But he also had a desire to visit Spain and visit Rome as a side uh, trip. Yeah, of course, whether he visited Spain or not, we don't know. But he got to Rome in a way he didn't really anticipate. It says, to be helped in my way there by you. Uh, that's to say that he's be, to be supplied by the Romans in some way. As to provide for his journey there. Before he continues on his planned trip to Spain, again, we don't know that he did visit Spain. 
he wants to visit with them for a while and enjoy their company. How long he planned on visiting with them is not known, only that it was for, quote unquote, a while. <clears throat> Verse 25 said, but, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. The, the ministering contemplated is the, the uh, supplying the poor among the brethren in Judea, Judea, which he was taking a collection there. Verse 26, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Now, the contribution uh, was intended to relieve the saints in Jerusalem, but it was intended to accomplish more than just relief. It would also gender, uh, engender in the minds of the Jews more kindly thoughts of the Gentile Christians than they would absent such a benevolence. It was taken up over a period of a year from an extensive Gentile region from, from uh, Corinth around through Macedonia along the northern shore of the Mediterranean as far as into Galatia. Now, all indications, we don't know how much, but all indications are that it was a substantial sum. In 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 12 through 15, it really uh, talks about this, for the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, we long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In verse 27, for it uh, pleased them, and they are their debtors. For the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things. Their duty is also to minister them in material things. The gospel was first preached in Jerusalem, and it was the Jews that first spread the gospel to the Gentile regions. So the Gentiles are their debtors for the spiritual things that were shared by the Jews. Since the Gentiles shared in the spiritual things possessed by the Jews originally, it was only right that the Gentiles share with the Jews their material things when the uh, Jews were in need. The Gentiles were in need of spiritual things and the Jews were in need of material things. In verse 28, therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, and the fruit was the contribution, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Paul proposes that when the contribution has been delivered to the brethren in Judea, he shall depart for Spain by way of Rome. That was his uh, intention. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> now let's read back in the first uh, chapter of Romans, uh, verses 8 through 15. Kind of get a refresher of this. First, it says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, is my witness, <clears throat> whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. 
Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, uh, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I and my dead are both the Greeks and the barbarians, both the wise and the unwise. And as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. <clears throat> so Paul felt sure that the brethren in Rome were ready in heart and mind to receive whatever additional blessings they needed. <clears throat> <clears throat> Verse 30, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and King James says, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, and ASB says, by the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through, in the same uh, words again, used in King James and ASB, and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. So he is beseeching the brethren in the name of, by the means of, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of the Spirit were the motives by which the brethren were to be moved to prayer. Striving means to struggle or carry on a combat or conflict in company with another. <clears throat> so it's a kind of a military term. The reader then is to strive, struggle with Paul in prayers for him. <clears throat> Verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. <clears throat> so to what end uh, are the prayers to be offered to God? Well, he wanted to be delivered from those Jews in Judea that still did not believe in the Christ and consequently opposed Paul. He does not ask here that they be converted. Now that uh, apparently is a hopeless expectation. Rather here, he desired deliverance from them. His prayer is answered, but not necessarily in, a, in an expected way. The wickedness of these unbelieving Jews enabled Paul to visit Rome. <clears throat> An additional thing that he prayed for was that the relief from the Gentile Christians, uh, or from the Gentile Christians for the Jewish Christians in, in Judea, particularly in Jerusalem, might be received in thankfulness for the Gentile generosity. In verse 32, he says that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Paul felt that he, if he could only be delivered from the unbelieving Jews <coughs> and his surf, uh, service proved acceptable to the brethren of Judea, he could come to the Romans with joy. His service was accepted with gratitude and thanks. He was not delivered to the unbelieving Jews. And he made the journey to Rome, but again, not in a way he expected. So uh, the lesson here is that we can propose, but it is God that disposes. <clears throat> In verse 33, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So this is the sum of all prayers and the embodiment of all good wishes. The God of peace is the God who wills peace among his people and opposes all who disturb it. So the concluding chapter uh, begins with, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. Uh, Phoebe, Phoebe is the only one commended to the brethren in Rome. So was it Phoebe who carried the letter to Rome? Well, maybe. We don't know. 
Uh, what kind of servant she was is not disclosed. <clears throat> so one does not necessarily have to be appointed to the service uh, in the church. But, you know, she may just have merely rendered service to the church. All we know is that Paul described her as a servant. There are some duties of service that only a, a woman may perform or are best adapted to perform. In some cases, it would not be appropriate for a man to assist a woman in certain matters. Therefore, the services of a woman are needed. Sincrea was the eastern harbor of uh, Corinth. An immense amount of trade passed through Sincrea on its way to or from Corinth. <clears throat> in verse 2, it says that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. <clears throat> well, she is a saint, a uh, sister in Christ. Saints are to receive saints in a worthy manner. Uh, Paul does not specify the nature of the business or what she may have needed from the brethren in the conduct of such a business. In her service to the church, she was a helper of many, including Paul. Exactly what that help was, uh, we do not know. <clears throat> greet, uh, in verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. Paul met uh, Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth on his second missionary German journey. Paul stayed there for a year and a half and worked with them in their tent making trade because, you know, Paul was a tent maker by trade. They accompanied Paul to Ephesus, at which time Paul left them there and traveled on to Jerusalem. At the time of the writing of this letter, they were in Rome. When they traveled there, is not known. Both were Paul's fellow workers in Christ. We are not told in what capacity their labor consisted. They were thoroughly acquainted with the gospel as to be qualified to instruct Apollo. Likely then they were qualified to teach the gospel to the Roman Gentiles. In verse 4, Romans 16, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, we are not told of the specific event in which they risked their own necks for Paul or where it took place. Well, Romans 5, 7, perhaps. If they saved his life, then uh, not only would Paul be grateful, but so would all the Gentile churches that benefited from Paul's preaching. In verse 5, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruit of Achaia to Christ. The private houses of brethren were often the only places where they could assemble for worship. By this time, Priscilla and Aquila had a house in which the brethren could meet. The church meeting there is called the church that is in their house. Of Epinetus, uh, we know nothing except what is said here. It, it is a masculine name, so we can say he was the first or among the first to embrace the gospel in Asia. He was, he's now in Rome. Greet Mary who labored much for us. Nothing beyond this verse is anything known about this woman or in what capacity and what circumstances she had labored so much for them. Greet, in verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junia, or Junia, uh, my countrymen, Benjamin, King James, and ASB. 
and my fellow prisoners who are, are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. <clears throat> we know nothing of this to except what is said here. Andronicus is a Greek masculine name, but uh, Junia now, uh, Junia in, in the Greek would be, be pronounced uh, Uni, Unius, or Junius in the ASB. It may be either masculine or feminine, we don't know. They are described as countrymen, which is Greek masculine, so more likely they're both uh, men. The New King James countrymen would be better translated kinsmen, as appears in the uh, King James and ASB version. It uh, may be that these two were Paul's blood kin, but that is not certain. Whatever relationship they had to Paul, uh, they were well known as uh, well known to the other apostles. So it's likely then that they hailed from the same area as Paul. Also, they became Christians before Paul. Were they among the uh, visitors from Rome who were gathered together to hear the first recorded gospel sermon delivered by Peter in Acts 2.10? If they became Christians on that first Pentecost after the resurrection, it is likely that they preached the gospel in Rome upon their return. Verse 8, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. We do not know why Amplius is the beloved of Paul, but it gives an insight as to the affection that Paul has for his fellow workers. <clears throat> Verse 9, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachius, uh, my beloved. Uh, nothing else is known of these two. Uh, where they walked, uh, worked with Paul is unknown, or where Urbanus worked with Paul is unknown. <clears throat> Greet hapless, uh, approved in Christ. Greet those who are the household of Aristobulus. Had hapless passed through some fierce ordeal? Uh, Paul did not say, Greet Aristobulus. So perhaps he was not present at this time. He may have been dead or visiting somewhere else. Verse 11, greet Herodian, my countryman. Again, is kinsman in the King James and ASB. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Nothing is known about uh, Herodian. He is referred to as Paul's countryman or kinsman. Nothing is known about Narcissus except that Paul writes uh, for them to greet those of his household and not Narcissus himself, just greet the household. Furthermore, they are to greet uh, only those who are in the Lord. <clears throat> <clears throat> greet, uh, verse 12, greet Rafina and Trafosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. All these names are Greek feminine. Now we see from this verse Paul's great appreciation for the work of women in the church. In verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. <clears throat> was this uh, Rufus the same in Mark 15, 21? He was the son of uh, Simon the Cyrene, Cyrene, who carried the cross of Jesus? Could be, could be. If so, the mother mentioned was his mother uh, literally. Uh, that's that's uh, Rufus's mother, literally, and then Paul's uh, by courtesy. Greek 
Ascincritus, Legion, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and Hermes is Mercurius in the King James Version, or Mercury in the ASV, and the brethren who are with him. In the Greek, Hermes is first, and then Hermes. Uh, same as in the ASB. Hermes is probably a variant of Hermes. Uh, nothing of these individuals is known from scripture, or the, although there is some traditional information attached to them, which we won't go into. Verse uh, 15, Greek, uh, Philologus, philo, Logos, philo Logos, and Julia, Nereus, and his sister, Olympus, and all the saints who are with him. Philologus is Greek masculine, and Julia is Greek feminine. Could they have been husband and wife, or maybe brother and sister? Uh, we just don't know. Olympus is Greek uh, masculine. And nothing is known of Nereus and his sister other than that mentioned here. Uh, nothing is known of uh, Olympus. Who are the saints who are with him? Christians, yes. But beyond that, nothing is known. To greet one another with a holy kiss, the churches of Christ greet you. <clears throat> Uh, and some kind of get the idea this is a kind of a holy smack or something like that or a smooch or what have you but that, that's just not what it is this is a very common phrase uh, 1 Corinthians 16 20 says greet one another with holy kiss 2 Corinthians 13 12 says greet one another with holy kiss 1 Thessalonians 5 26 says greet all the brethren with holy kiss 1 Peter 5 14 says, I greet one another with a kiss of love. And that kind of kiss is a, is a holy kiss. <clears throat> so the usual salutation was a kiss on the forehead, cheek, beard, never the lips. The custom was for the, for the men to kiss the men and the women to kiss the women. This greeting was a custom before the beginning of Christianity. Paul emphasizes here that in other places that the kish uh, should be holy. It is customary in our society that we uh, that handshakes are the form of the greeting. Whatever form it may take, it must be holy. So Paul was writing for, from Corinth. He sends greetings from the churches in that, that area. He refers to these churches as the churches of Christ. If they are churches of Christ in the aggregate, then each one is a church of Christ in the singular. That is a proper designation of what they were and what each local congregation is. That, that is a constituent of the designation churches of Christ. In verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, note, Mark, I mean Mark in the King James ASB, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. So Paul now turns to a problem that either is plaguing the Roman church or will shortly. If this were not the case, then Paul would have said nothing. There is a sense of urgency for them to address and remediate the situation or at least anticipate it. Note or mark means to watch attentively, observe closely, and to beware. What the divisions or offenses were in this instance are alluded to in the next verse. So whether it's doctrinal or faction, Paul does not say here, but these divisions and offenses were contrary to the doctrine of Christ that the Romans had learned, and it destroyed the peace and brotherly love of the church. Paul had pleaded with the Corinthian brethren that quote unquote, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all be, uh, speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. So apparently there was or would be a sectarian spirit to infect the Roman church. These brethren wanted to have it their own way, whether it be the Judaizers or some other faction. 
So Paul commands the Roman brethren, and by extension us, to mark, take note of, and avoid them by refusing to recognize and to associate with them as brethren. This requirement is imperative and necessary to preserve the harmony and unity of the church. For those who are such in verse 18, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Things not taught in the scriptures cannot be taught as binding on the brethren or as necessary in one service to Christ. Men who teach such uh, place themselves on a par or at odds with the commandments of God. They do so to satisfy their own selfish desires. Those who would cause divisions to sat satisfy their own ends usually do not announce that their intent is to draw disciples to themselves. Rather, they use kind, sweet, and to the simple, plausible, but deceptive words. In verse 19, for your obedience has been known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Paul praises their obedience that is known all around, as if to say that the warnings of verse 17 and 18 are not meant exclusively for them, and maybe even meant more uh, so for those who had a lesser reputation. But the warning stands regardless of the firm foundation on which anyone may stand. He cautions that he would have them to be wise and skilled in what is good and wise and unskilled in that which is uh, evil. If one is firmly established in the true faith, one only has to compare things with that faith to determine whether the thing is good or evil. And the grace of peace, and the God of grace, uh, God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. God is the God of peace and not sex and divisions among brethren. If we do as directed by the scriptures in, in avoiding those who call division and are skilled in evil and exercise wisdom and skilled in doing good, then God will quickly enable us to, to triumph over the evil intentions of Satan. He will, in fact, uh, be crushed, that is Satan, he in fact be crushed under our feet. Verse 21, my uh, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. Paul was a well-known uh, companion of Paul. Well, Timothy was a well-known companion of Paul. He is said to be Paul's fellow worker. Is Lucius the same mentioned in Acts 13, verse 1? Mm, could be, maybe. Was this the Jason of Acts 17, verses 5 through 7? Well, again, maybe. Is uh, Sosipater the same as in Acts 20, verse 4? Well, maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> in verse uh, 22, uh, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Uh, Tertius appears to be Paul's amanuensis. Paul, uh, Paul seldom wrote with his own hand. It was noted that in Galatians 6.11, Paul said, see with what large letters I have written to you in my own hand. The fact that he noted it would, be, would highlight the unusual event of his writing down his words, that rather than it being done by amanuensis, it was also his custom to put the finishing flourishes on his letters in his own hand. In verse 23, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. And Cordus, a brother. So Gaius is mentioned in uh, 1 Corinthians one uh, fourteen, And uh, Erastus is mentioned in Acts 19, verse 22. Uh, but nothing is known of Cordus. Verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is further evidence of uh, Paul's fervent love for his brethren and solicitude for their well-being. 
Verse 25, now to him, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. The now might indicate that these remaining verses were written by Paul's own hand. The quote unquote, my gospel is the gospel that Paul preached, which of course is the gospel of Christ. When he says my gospel, he is excluding the gospel of those who preach a perverted gospel. Uh, that we read about in Galatians, the uh, first chapter, uh, six through nine. This gospel is the one preached by Jesus Christ. His preaching was the preaching of Christ as well, that is, the preaching demanded by Christ. The gospel of Christ was the gospel of salvation to all men, Romans 1 16. So, a uh, mystery is a thing not known uh, to man, that is, it. Is, has not yet been revealed to him. And you can read about that in Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 8. As an example, in Mark 16, 15 through 16, he said to them, Go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, Luke 24, verse 46 through uh, 15 through 16, he talks about preaching his name to all nations. So Jews did not understand that every creature or all nations included the Gentiles. It was a mystery to them. Verse 26, but now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. But now the mystery had been revealed and made manifest. When this truth was clearly revealed, it could be seen how this truth had been manifested in the Old Testament prophecies. prophecies. The end of it all was for the obedience to the faith once delivered. So Romans, the 16th chapter, verse 27, to God alone, the wise, be glory to Jesus Christ forever. So all wisdom emanates from God through his son, Jesus Christ. So that ends the study of uh, uh, Romans. And I might make, just make mention of the fact that all these individuals mentioned in 16th chapter, most of them we don't know anything about. But they've been honored for all eternity because they were uh, memorialized in this epistle by Paul himself for all eternity. So uh, all I can say is I would like to have your name uh, mentioned in a favorable manner by Paul in one of his epistles. So that concludes the announcement that we'll start with our study of uh, uh, logic and the Bible uh, next week. Thank you.